Hello, my name is Jose Alberto Luzardo and welcome to my channel and to this video series on robust control applied to the hard disk drive servo system. This is our agenda. In our two previous videos, we have dealt with robust control theory for single input, single output systems and for multiple input, multiple output systems. In this video, we are going to cover the theory of operation of HDD servo systems. Our next video will be on how to set up our particular HDD servo system to apply robust control. And then we follow up through the end of our presentation. In this slide, we have a representation of a hard disk drive or HDD. We can see here the main components of an HDD. The HDD consists of several disks or platters stacked together one above the other and they spin thanks to the spindle motor over here. There are two platters in this graphical representation, but we can expect more than two in a typical HDD. The disks are coated by a magnetic film that can be magnetized in little tiny sections with the two different magnetic polarities. The read-right head magnetizes the medium when it writes, and this information can be read back by the head later on. The read-right head is mounted on the tip of the arm. Every single platter has an arm with its head and all the arms are stacked together in the assembly called E-block. The E-block rotates around the pivot. We can see here that as the E-block rotates around its pivot, the head can reach radially any position from the inner diameter to the outer diameter. The E-block is activated by the voice coil motor. If you are intrigued by the word voice, just keep in mind that VCMs are also typical of speakers. This motor is an electromechanical device which consists of a coil that produces a magnetic torque proportional to the electric current that flows through it. It is important to notice that as the disc spins, the head literally flies suspended above the surface by a very tiny distance because of the aerodynamic conditions created by the airflow at the disc spins at very high speeds, something between 7,000 RPM to 15,000 or 20,000 RPM, that is, revolutions per minute. The voice coil motor is the main actuator without which the control will be impossible. More sophisticated HDDs include a microactuator, which is a piezoelectric device we can see in the zoom. This microactuator can micro move the head and achieve higher resolutions. It's very useful in those cases of high memory density where tracks are very tied together. We haven't talked about tracks yet, but we will soon. Additionally, it also increases the bandwidth as it can deal with high frequency disturbances or perturbations. In this presentation, we do not consider microactuators. In this picture, we see how the information is stored in HDDs. The information is stored in concentric circles called track. These tracks are sectioned into data sectors and servo sectors. Data sectors contain the actual data and servo sectors contain relevant information of the track itself. We can see clearly that the higher amount of tracks, the more capacity the hard drive has. For a 1 terabyte drive, the track density is above the 100,000 tracks per inch. However, in this video, we are going to be modest and our example will have a fraction of that density that is, around 25,000 tracks per inch. Perhaps at this point, it's relevant to say that the storage density in an HDD is an aerial density where tracks per inch, TPI, is one dimension and the other one is bits per second, BPI. 
that can be stored along the length of the track. So it wouldn't be difficult to find an aerial density of 1 terabit per square inch in today's HDDs. For control purposes, we need to focus now on the servo sectors. Next picture is more illustrative on this respect. Here we can see what happens. To read or write the information on a track, the voice call motor must move the head to the corresponding track. This is called SICK. Then the head must stay steady on the particular track, that is, the head should remain at the particular distance radius from the center of the disc, as illustrated in the figure. This is called tracking. The head will stay on that particular track until the requested data in the track is retrieved or stored. The SICK and the tracking control systems require two different controllers. In this video, we focus only on the tracking control system. To control the position of the read-write head, we need information of the current position of the head. In other words, we need position feedback. The position feedback is embedded in the servo sector. As the head keeps on floating above the track, the magnetic transitions underneath induce a voltage that is picked up by the head. These magnetic transitions are precisely timed and synchronized. When a servo sector passes by underneath the head, its pattern can be recognized as a servo part pattern and not a da data pattern. The illustration shows the components of the servo track, but we are more interested in the servo burst. Depending on the number of servo sectors and the speed of the spindle, the servo patterns repeat a certain number of times per second. It is actually a sem sample time system and not a continuous time system. In the top figure, we can see the servo boards that provide the track position. Left to right is the track direction, and up and down is the radial direction. As the disc spins, the head will detect first the boards A, then B, C, and D in that order. We can see four different head positions enumerated 1, 2, 3, and 4 in the figure. Notice that when the head is on track, positions 1 and 3. The boards A and B start exactly at the center of the track and span radially opposing each other. In position 1, track A-1, C is off track and the middle of D coincides with the track. Whereas in position 3, track N, D is off track and the middle of C coincides with the track. This arrangement is fundamental in how the head position around the track is found. For that, we need to understand the signal that is picked up by the read-write head. In the bottom figure, we can see the signals picked up by the head. When the head is in position 1, track M-1, the pattern is as shown in the upper left corner. A and B have the same amplitude because these bursts are located at the same radial distance relatively to the head. The head picks up the same signal intensity coming from A and B. C has no amplitude because it's far away from the head, and D has the maximum amplitude because it's exactly centered with respect to the head, which makes the head detect the maximum signal from D. Pos position 2 corresponds to the right upper corner in the figure at the bottom. This position is off track by half a track pitch towards track N. In this case, the head will detect the maximum amplitude of A because A is centered with respect to the head. B has no amplitude because it's far away from the head, and C and D have equal amplitudes because they are at the same radial distance from the head. 
Similarly, we can obtain the other two signals from the other two positions. Then we can see that the suitable position error signal PES is given by PES equals A minus B, where A is the amplitude of, of bars A and B is the amplitude of bars B. So when the head is directly on the center of the track, PES equals zero. The absolute value of PES is proportional approximately to the distance of the track. Notice that PES is not actually a position measurement but an error measurement. Then the idea for the tracking control is to guarantee that PES remains very close to zero. This problem is called regulation. Besides PES given by A and B, as I explained before, we have the other signal C minus B which is as important as PES. Let's see why. In this figure we see the two signals. In phase PES had to do with A and B and in quadrature PES has to do with C and D as explained before. Notice that when the in phase PES is zero we have two different slopes. Sometimes the slope is positive and sometimes the slope is negative. The tracking controller needs to know when the in phase PES slope is positive and when is negative otherwise the system will come unstable. This is when we use the quadrature PES. Notice that when the slope of in phase PES is positive, the quadrature PES is negative and vice versa. Then the real PES for the control system is given by PES equals minus PES in phase times the sine of the PES in quadrature. Notice the high nonlinearity of PES. To guarantee to follow one specific track, the absolute value of PES cannot be larger than half the track pitch. If it goes beyond half a track pitch, the error equation is not valid any longer.